Hey folks, welcome Azure Cosmos DB Live TV. I'm your host, Mark Brown. Uh, I've got with me a guest, Brian Dunnington. Brian, how are you? Doing great, Mark. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, just like we were talking earlier before the show, I got some terrible allergies last night and was up all night coughing. And uh, yeah, I just hope I'm okay. It's been it's a rough, been rough spring. I mean, uh, I don't know. I may have I heard the new COVID variant is supposed to make you think you got bad allergies, but yeah, uh, you know, we had a lot of rain <clears throat> this spring, and so there's the super bloom kind of going on. I think it may be that as well. So, but yeah. uh, hey, Brian, uh, in, but, uh, we've been having a great spring up here so far. <laughs> yeah, we're like heat wave, uh, yeah. amazing. It's like, would you guys have like 90s over the weekend or something? Up yeah, in I got up over 90s. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty, I, pretty rare for me. Uh, that's rare. For, I mean, I pretty rare at all there for over 20 years. There's yeah. that doesn't happen in May. Yeah, uh, that's that's July August weather. So yeah, uh, yeah congratulations on your. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, uh, we'll get to what you're going to talk about today. Uh, just tell us a little about yourself. Oh, yeah. So I'm an engineering manager at Microsoft. I work on the team that builds Microsoft Learn. So if you use any of the docs on Microsoft or any of that stuff, that's the team I work on. Uh, the team I specifically work on uh, builds a bunch of backend services that deal with identity and all the things that kind of deal with users. So if you go to the site and you create a profile and learn uh, and anything you do that's tracked towards you. So uh, you take learning and you get achievements and you earn progress, you earn certifications, all that stuff is uh, kind of in the ballpark of what we work on. So Got yeah, it. it's pretty fun. So all that gamification that goes on when you do learn labs and stuff, that's, is that all of your team and stuff yep. that builds all of that infrastructure? And then yep. of course, all yep. the, all the profile yep. stuff, because you can see all the badges and other stuff you've, uh, you've earned in there uh, through all the content you've gone through. So that's all your, that's all your folks, right? Yeah. All right. All well, that stuff. Cool. Yep. So, all right. In yeah. Fact, I, in fact, some of the stuff they built for learn will make an appearance uh, today, maybe. Oh, okay. Sounds good. You're teasing us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, let's get to it. Uh, you're going to talk about something that uh, is something I'm quite passionate about uh, and something that I've been getting asked by customers for, as long as I've been on this team, uh, and that is, uh, hey, I want to build uh, like an auto increment feature, just like SQL has, or I have data that is sitting in multiple containers uh, or in multiple partitions, and I need to have uh, acid guarantees around that data. And fundamentally, what they're ask is, is, hey, I need a way to create uh, a distributed lock across all this data such that I can generate a unique monotonically increasing integer to use for a primary uh, key or uh, to ensure that I've got complete uh, consistency for my data across some kind yeah. of transactional uh, semantics there. And uh, you know, my answer to them is basically, they asked us like, would you please go build this feature? And, and my answer is, is no. Uh, hmm. <laughs> the reason, and I'm not trying to be mean or flippant, but there's actually some really good reasons for this, uh, uh, least of which, or not least of which, is the fact that uh, Cosmos is a distributed data store. Like we've got four replicas of your data sitting uh, in a single region. Uh, and also we also distribute geographically as well, which even complicates things further. Mm -hmm. So uh, building such a thing like that has always kind of been at odds for what we're really about, mm -hmm. which is we want to have kind of that guarantee for latency that guarantee for performance. Uh, so doing things like enlisting multiple machines into this distributed transaction type coordinated process uh, has always been at odds uh, with, yeah. with what, you know, we as a team and the, you know, we're a product, right? We're a service. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we want to make sure is that we probably buy that as a highest order bit uh, versus doing a thing like a distributed transaction. So, so you're here uh, because you were probably like one of those customers that said, hey, I need a way to be able to, to provide this, either one of those two things or something similar to that uh, and do that uh, kind of across our distributed database uh, environment within Cosmos, right? So that's what we're going to talk about today, folks, is uh, distributed locks and Cosmos. Yeah. And uh, what I love most about uh, what you're going to show us today is the fact that uh, you actually used Cosmos to solve your problem. Uh, yeah, that's, I, the, that's the cool part is uh, you talked about, you know, some of the issues or some of the things you do with Cosmos. And then we actually use Cosmos to solve our own problem. And then uh, to, we could also use it for other things that even if you're not 
trying to write data to Cosmos, maybe you've just got some other thing that you want to synchronize work on, you can still do that. Uh, but Cosmos is kind of the secret sauce behind the scenes. Yeah. All right. Well, show us. Uh, I love you got a few slides, and then I think you're going to show us some some cool stuff here. Uh, so I'll just let you let let's dive in and uh, and take a look. Yeah, and so before we get into the details, I wanted to talk about kind of a super common app scenario, and in fact, one that we had on the Learn site that I was just talking about, uh, and hopefully people, you know, that'll set some context so they can understand kind of where we're coming from. So uh, imagine you're building a website and you want there to be users on your website. So it could be, you know, social media site, could be an e-commerce site, anything where you want users, I and mean, that's a pretty common requirement for lots of sites. And so you want users to register on your website, and those users have let's say username. So, you know, I want to be Brian, you want to be Mark, uh, but we want to make sure that people don't, you know, have the same username. We don't want two Brian's. That doesn't make any sense. So what you might do is, you know, you've got your users and they'll make a request to your service. And then you're going to ultimately create an account for them in your database. So when you do that, you know, you might have some, this is some pseudocode, but you know, it's something where you check and see if the username's already taken. And if it isn't, you create the user pretty straightforward. Uh, and, you know, it makes sense. Uh, but what can happen is uh, most of the time you probably want more than one user on your site. And so uh, as your traffic grows, you might get two users and you could get two users even making the request at almost the same exact instance. And so when that happens, uh, two requests will come in almost at the same exact time. And so when they do, they'll hit this code and this first line will go off. And you can imagine this is, you know, maybe checking database or something to see if the user exists. Uh, and it'll go off and ask, does this username exist? And the answer will come back, no. But in the meantime, the second request has come in. It's hit this line, and it's gone off and asked the database, hey, does this username exist? And at that point, it still doesn't either because the create user hasn't ran yet. And so what ha will happen is both of them essentially will pass that first check, uh, and you'll get into this kind of create user scenario, and then both user accounts will try to get created. And if they were using the same username, you know that's not good. You don't want two records with the same username. And so, you know, kind of the idiomatic way of solving this, if you're doing something like this, this is kind of pseudocode, but you can imagine if this was C-sharp code, you might do something like uh, wrap this in a lock. And so a lock is a keyword, you know, it's, a, it's built into language. And so what happens then is essentially it prevents, you know, multiple threads from getting into this kind of critical section at the same time. So when the request comes in, the first one, even if they come in, it's almost the same second, one of them will hit this lock first, it'll obtain the lock, uh, it'll go on then to the next line and check if the username exists. And if not, it'll create the user. Meanwhile, the other request is waiting. Uh, it can't obtain that lock while the first one has it. And as soon as you're out of the critical section, after the first thread has created the user, the next one will be able to obtain the lock. But this time, it'll call and check if the username exists. It will because you've already created the user uh, and you'll have you know kind of synchronized your work so that you didn't end up with two users with the same username or whatever your scenario is. So pretty simple way to, to kind of synchronize work uh, on a single machine. But like most sites, you probably want more than two users as well. And you know you probably want lots of users. That's what do we all want, right? We want to grow our site huge. So you can imagine as you start getting more and more users, you know maybe those users are all over the world, you need to scale up your site. And so maybe you scale it across multiple regions, just like you were mentioning about Cosmos itself. Uh, and maybe in each of those regions, you scale it up. You know, So you've got multiple instances in each region. So you've got lots of failover, a lot of redundancy. And now you've got lots of users making lots of requests, perhaps simultaneously to a bunch of instances all spread around the world. And now you're, this locking code doesn't work anymore because this code is only essentially protecting you on a single instance in a single process on a machine. So if I get two requests that come into two different machines uh, at the same time, this lock is useless at that point because the first thread will grab it on a whole different machine. A request will come in. It'll grab it because it doesn't know that the lock exists on some other machine in a different part of the world. Uh, and then you've, you've defeated the purpose of this lock again. And so you're back kind of to square one of how do you synchronize work across multiple <clears throat> machines uh, in multiple different areas? And so what you need essentially is something that does the job of this lock, but you need it to be something that kind of is cloud enabled. So you can work across multiple instances and multiple regions. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about uh, and a couple of things, but that's the the gist of it. And it's kind of give a little bit of context of where yep. we're headed with this. No, nope, that's good. Cool. And so, like I said, we have this exact scenario on the site that I helped build, uh, Microsoft Learn. So we got lots of users. I think at last count, there was something like 20 million. Uh, and so we've got our site deployed across a bunch of regions and a bunch of instances. 
uh, and it auto scales up and all this stuff. And so we needed to uh, handle this exact scenario. So what we did is we started thinking about like, what can we do? How can we build this kind of cloud distributed lock? And so we considered a couple of things. We, we first started with, what do we need it to do? So it obviously needs to live outside of your code. If it's just in your code, you know, it's gonna be tied to the process uh, and that's not gonna work when it's spread across multiple instances. Uh, it needed to be highly available. Just like you said, you know, it's cloud native and it's, we have to have, you know, uptime 99.999. Um, and so it needs to be always, always available. And we want it to be fast. Like we don't want the locking to introduce, you know, latency or something just on trying to synchronize this work. So we considered a couple different options. Uh, one of which was using Azure storage, uh, in Azure storage, there are, there's a capability built in for getting leases on blobs. And, uh, actually, if you look at how Azure functions work, they use this internally to synchronize work. So if you imagine something like a timer trigger. Uh, and you've got a function app and you deploy it up and maybe that function app scales out you know, to 10 or 100 or however many instances you've got. When the timer ticks, you don't want all 10 or 100 of them to start processing the work. The point is that the scaling is a performance benefit, but the code should still only do one thing. And so behind the scenes, it uses a blob lease uh, to synchronize that work. We also considered stuff like uh, Redis, which you might be more familiar with you know, for a cache, but there are tools like, or patterns like Redlock, which essentially build a cloud distributed lock, kind of like we're talking about, on top of Redis. Um, for our scenario, we kind of chose not to go that route, partly because we weren't using Redis already for this particular project. And so it was adding a new kind of resource that we didn't really need. And to really get the most out of the Redlock implementation, you need to have several instances running uh, so that when you try to obtain the lock, it tries to get it across the quorum uh, and it has some of that kind of functionality built in. And so it added quite a bit of complexity for something that we weren't already leveraging. But something we were already leveraging was Azure Cosmos DB. So in our case, we happened to be storing our user accounts in Cosmos DB. They didn't need to be there. They could have been in a different database, but they already were. And we already knew it was highly available. It was fast. And so we started thinking about how can we leverage this thing that we're already using to achieve this goal that we want to achieve. So what we did was, uh, this is not the exact code in there, but kind of representative of what we did. So if you look at this, it looks pretty much like the code we saw before. There's an if check on the first line there that kind of says, is the thing available? And then if so, you know, in the in the block, it goes ahead and does its work. So for our use case, we used uh, code like this for both creating user accounts and for updating. So if I'm a user and I already have a username and I want to change it to something else, we want to do the same. We want to make sure, you know, it's not already taken. And so kind of kind of looks like that pseudocode did. And if you go into what that ensure account available does, uh, this is kind of where the Azure Cosmos DB came in. So we decided that we would try to write a record to the database and we would leverage uh, Cosmos's optimistic concurrency to let it decide if the record was already there. And so we can see, we just kind of create this lightweight account object. In our case, the ID is the, the username that we're locking on, could have been anything. Uh, and then we try to create the item. So that create item async will get called. If the record doesn't exist, Cosmos will create it. And that's essentially the equivalent of we've acquired the lock now. We were able to successfully write this record. Nobody else has already written a record with that ID. Uh, if they had, then that create item async would fail. Uh, we would get a conflict status code. And that would tell us that somebody else is already operating on this ID. So you can't obtain the lock essentially. And this did exactly what we wanted to do for this specific use case. Uh, it allowed us to use the centralized thing, which was our Cosmos DB, to kind of play the role of that cloud distributed lock instead of a, a thread specific lock. But well, let's talk a little bit about, so this is kind of where we landed on it. This was a very single specific use case solution. Like we only did it to solve this exact scenario. Um, and like I said, we were already using Cosmos DB, so that made it a natural fit. But there was a couple of things about it that were, they worked for our scenario, but they may not work for other scenarios. So uh, we were able to optimize it. So it only locked on colliding values. So you can imagine in that, first pseudocode that we had, you know, you were locking an object that might lock every single time you're creating any user account, but we didn't really want to do that. If, if I'm trying to create an account and my username is Brian and you're trying to create one and yours is Mark, those aren't going to collide. So I don't need to block you from creating your account while I'm creating mine because they're not colliding values. And so by locking on a specific value, not the entire process or type of object, uh, we were able to be very granular about a lock so we could be very uh, efficient. So we could lock on individual usernames and only have to worry about when they actually collided. Uh, and then also in there, I didn't talk too much about it. We'll talk about it more in the implementation, but uh, 
one of the things that we also leveraged was the Cosmos's Time to Live, TTL expiration. So if you don't know, uh, Cosmos supports uh, TTL values on both the container and on an individual record level. And what that means is you can set a special field in there that's the TTL, and Cosmos will use your excess RUs to go in and automatically delete the records after the TTL expires. And so for our use case, that was super nice. We could go ahead and create that record you saw in there. And if it had succeeded, that meant we got the lock. At that point, we didn't really need the record anymore. We just, that meant we had acquired the lock. So we set the TTL uh, to a few seconds. And then that means a few seconds later, Cosmos would come behind us and clean it up. And we didn't have to keep cleaning up that table. So it was sort of self-maintaining. And that all worked great. But like I said, it was very specific to this exact use case. Um, and so we started thinking about this might be a useful tool to expand to other use cases. And there's definitely some room for improvement. So some of those things that we thought about were, uh, in this scenario, you can only get the lock, or try to get the lock immediately. And so if that ensure account available line ran, either Cosmos would be able to insert the record or there'd be a record existing and it would say there's conflict and you can't. That was it. You couldn't wait uh, and say, I want to wait until the lock becomes available, then take it myself. And for our use case, that was fine. We weren't trying to synchronize work so much as uh, block a specific section of code at a single time. But that's a very useful thing to be able to do is to be able to wait to acquire a lock so that you could coordinate work. So if, you know, if someone's got it, you'll say, great, as soon as you're done, I'm going to grab it. And then as soon as I'm done, someone else might grab it. So that's a feature that we uh, wanted to add as well. Using that TTL also meant that we would hold that lock uh, until the TTL expired. And so uh, Cosmos lets you set the TTL for in one second increments. So you can one second is the minimum, and you can set it, uh, you know, and you can't set it for milliseconds or anything. And so in our case, that again was good because as soon as we knew that the username was not taken, we were going to create an account for you and your username would be taken. And so it didn't really matter to us if that lock was held a little bit longer than we needed it because we weren't synchronizing work. The flip side of that is that the lock always expires after the TTL. And there was no way to renew it or hold it longer if you needed to. So you can imagine maybe your code, you obtain the lock successfully, and then the code that you're locking on, you know, the code you're locking around that kind of critical section, maybe it takes longer than you think. You know, there's something happens, the network is slow, whatever's happening that you takes a long time. And then what would happen in this case is let's say your TTL was set to five seconds. After five seconds, your that record would get deleted even if your code wasn't done doing what it was doing. And so somebody else might grab it, and then depending on what your code was doing, you know, there might be a conflict. In our case, there wasn't, like I said, because as soon as we obtained the lock, we were gonna create your username and the username would already be taken at that point. So it didn't really matter for our use case, but that would be a very common thing that could happen for a more generic use case. Uh, and so all these kind of led us to wanting to expand this so that it wasn't the specific solution to our problem, but to kind of take this idea and make this kind of cloud distributed lock that we could use for any kind of locking scenario where you wanted to lock across processes across machines. And so that's what kind of led us to what I'm going to talk about now. That, this is cool. So uh, it, it's nice you went and took it extra further because uh, like the stuff you're describing here would apply if you had a shared resource scenario where you were trying to take a lock on it. But with your username, that's not necessarily shared resource, right? I mean, you're locking... Yeah. The name of the lock is the name of the user versus yeah. uh, taking a lease on a lock called grab a name or something like that, yeah. where everybody's you have contention over the same thing, critical path for every single thing that comes in. That's not a very yeah. good scalable design. But if you settle on the lock itself being it, it unique and not requiring a lease object against that, it's basically the lock is a lease basically on the thing. And yeah, uh, exactly. so, that, uh, so that's cool. I and mean, it's nice you took it a little extra further. Uh, and there, I've got some questions around uh, kind of your uh, your TTL on there, but I want to let you keep going, and I'll ask it later. When okay. I yeah. Well, I'll get to, in a sec show where we set it and how that comes into play. So. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we kind of took this list of things of what we thought we could improve and decided to come up with something else. So let's go look at some of that code and see how it all works. Oops, that's not where we want to go. We want to go here. <laughs> Uh, so this is a little library that uh, we wrote, and there's some other parts in here that kind of help you register it for dependency injection and a few things. But the meat of it starts with this cloud distributed lock provider. And you can see the interface. There's just two methods. There's try to acquire the lock, which means, you know, can I get it or not? It's, it'll either get it immediately or you won't be able to. Or acquire the lock, which lets you wait either a specific amount of time or indefinitely. And so the implementation of that is pretty straightforward. The 
acquire lock, which lets you wait. You either can pass a timeout value or it'll wait indefinitely. And then it'll just continue to try to acquire it. Uh, the try just tries once. And if it can acquire it, you get it. And if not, you'll get an unacquired lock. The meat of this, uh, which is backed by Azure Cosmos DB, which is why I'm here talking about it, uh, is in this Cosmos lock client. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see this code, it looks pretty much just like we saw in that original implementation where we tried to acquire the lock, which is essentially try to create the item uh, and then use the optimistic concurrency to see if it gets created. And if it doesn't, you'll get a conflict, which means somebody else already has a lock and return. So this, this looks almost identical to what we had originally. There's a few extra things in here. We generate a safe lock name because that value uh, IDs in Cosmos, you know, have a couple of reserved special characters you can't use. So if you said, you know, I want my username to be slash slash plus something, that wouldn't work as an ID. So we just generated a safe name. Uh, but otherwise, this is pretty much verbatim the code that we had uh, in the in the first go around. So acquiring the lock works in pretty much the same way. Once you've acquired the lock, uh, you can see in here we return you this lock object, or maybe if you can't get it, you get an unacquired lock. The lock itself. Uh, does a couple of cool things. One is if you if you don't get it, you get an unacquired lock, which just means that there's a property that says, you know, did I acquire it? False, and you can then you know branch your code. But if you do acquire the lock, uh, one of the other things we talked about is that room for improvement was being able to not have the lock expire after the TTL. It's essentially, being able to renew the locks as long as you're holding it. So if your code is taking longer than you think, you can keep renewing the lock and saying, I still got it. I'm, you know, don't take it yet, guys. I'm still working on this. And so when you create this. Uh, it will actually start this keep alive and it will start renewing itself uh, periodically. So as long as your code is running and you know, your process hasn't crashed, it'll keep renewing the lock, essentially saying you want to keep holding it for as long as you need. That could introduce a problem where you hold the lock indefinitely and you never let anybody else grab it. So you can imagine if you're holding it and we're renewing it and then your code goes awry or something and you never stop renewing it, that you could essentially hold it forever. And so what uh, we're back to the TTL then where what will happen is if your code crashes or something, you've got the lock, you're not going to be able to release it because your process isn't running anymore. What will happen is the renewals will stop because the, the object's you know gone when your app crashes. And so then the TTL will kick in again. So that TTL now acts as a kind of fail safe. So instead of saying the lock will expire at this time, it's more like saying if the lock has been abandoned at we'll wait, you know, this is the fail safe. And after so many seconds or what do you set it to, we're going to go ahead and release the lock anyway, so that the next consumers that are trying to acquire the lock won't be blocked indefinitely. Uh, and then by implementing it this way uh, in a more generic way, we also, we implemented the iDisposable. So uh, this can be disposed, which means you can use it with a using statement so that uh, you can wrap your critical section with this. And as soon as you're done doing your work, so maybe your work only took a few milliseconds, uh, the lock can get released. Whereas before it would have had to, we just kind of fired and forget, and then it would just automatically release when the TTL uh, expired, but that could have been a whole, whole second or however long later. Now, by having it disposed automatically or being wrapped with dispose, it can release the lock uh, as soon as your work is done, even if it's much quicker than the TTL. Uh, and that's those two methods for the renewal and the delete probably look pretty similar. The renew just literally updates the record uh, we do write a, a last renew date so if a human's looking at it, they can see but otherwise it pretty much just updates the record and that means that what will happen is the ttl essentially says whenever you write the record you know start counting and when you reach the ttl we'll delete it but when you upstart the record it essentially starts the clock over and so every time we renew it the ttl gets pushed out when we stop renewing it then the ttl will kick in uh, there is this fail safe in here if for some reason uh, you had the lock and you lost the lock somehow. Uh, you maybe your code did something wrong and released the lock, and someone else grabbed it. And then later you tried to renew it. Uh, you would by using the e tag, uh, you would get a precondition failed, meaning hey, you didn't actually hold this lock anymore. You tried to renew it, but you're not the holder of lock. Someone else acquired the lock, and your your code is an error. You shouldn't be trying to renew a lock that has already been expired and given out to someone else. So that's another key piece. Uh, I just want to dive in on is. <clears throat> The e tag it's, itself is almost like a like a bearer token in it, and yeah. that it, it provides the the security, if you will. Like I'm going to renew this thing. Okay, show me the e tag, a valid e tag that allows me to do that. There you go. Uh, and then if it does, great. If not, no, sir, you did not hold a valid. Yep. 
lease or lock on this thing. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's another key aspect in this. And that's and, something that could be really quite complicated to build yourself, but yeah. by leveraging what Cosmos offered, I mean, it's literally this simple. We just say, yeah, yeah. You know, pass it back. And it was dead simple. Whereas you can imagine if, if that wasn't there, like trying to coordinate that and check, you know, and, and developing a system that made sure you did that. I mean, that could be very, very complicated. And this was, you know, essentially, you know, not even a one liner. So that was another reason why we really wanted, you know, really were happy to leverage Cosmos DB to do this. And then the release, you know, it's just deleting the record. So when we're all done, we we'll delete it. And the same thing here. If you try to delete it and your e-tag is, you know, old, just like we saw up higher, uh, we'll just do nothing, essentially. We'll say, that's fine. It already had been released outside of Europe, and we don't need to do anything. I love the fact that you implemented iDisposal and that... Uh... That's a really cool thing. Like I, we, I built uh, and also <laughs> a distributed lock as well. I haven't released it yet, uh, but I didn't implement it the same way. So you had to explicitly say, "Okay, work is done. Release the lock at the end of the critical section." Whereas, yeah, so we wanted to make sure. I don't know. I'll just bring this up while you're talking. So it's this much is simpler the way you did this by implementing I disposal and then just having it in a using. Uh, so once it once it once it exits, it's just, I disposal. It's called and boom, it's done. Yep, exactly. And so this is, we'll look, talk about this in a sec, but here's kind of the sample use case. So I'm going to acquire the lock. And again, like the lock name can be that very granular value. It could be an individual username or something. So it's not locking on, you know, users, the concept, but on yeah. a specific name. Uh, and then by wrapping in that using, I can then do my work. And then as soon as this goes out of scope, the lock is released. So it might take, you know, just a few milliseconds and then you can already release it. So it makes it so that you're, you can operate you know, at a much higher kind of throughput than the TTL minimum. TTL only goes down to one second. Yeah. And so that would mean otherwise, you know, you could only, every time you took a lock, you're at minimum one second, but this allows you to release it, you know, as quickly as your code can run. Yeah. That's yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's very, it's, uh, that's nice and neat. And with a yeah. little bow on top, it's exactly yeah. the right way of implementing that. So yeah. love it. And so there's a couple other properties in that lock. Uh, you can see a few of them in use there. Uh, just tells you if it's acquired so that you can see in there there's a check you do have to check uh, because it could be that especially on this try acquire that you weren't able to acquire lock someone else is holding lock you wanted to see if you could get it you can't so you didn't acquire the lock if not like in this sample we'll say that you know we weren't able to acquire the lock uh, there's a couple other properties uh, we do expose the e-tag just in case you want to use that for something uh, a lock id this kind of just helps if you're looking at it as a human to kind of differentiate two different ones uh, and then a the fencing token, we'll talk about that in a little bit, about how you can use that for your downstream services to coordinate some of that work that you were talking about at the beginning. Um, and then, like I said, there's a few other little bits and bobs in here we, we can talk about, but it's mostly just kind of some setup, helping you register with DI. How about the renew? So let's just say you've uh, you've got a lease TTL for one second and you were getting, I don't know, two tenths of a second away. Uh, how, do you, how are you triggering your renew? Uh, within that critical section. Yeah, so I think that's in the same class. Uh, so this is that initialized keep alive, and it kind of does what you just said. So it looks at the TTL and then essentially backs it off by some amount. So yeah, right before the keep the TTL would have expired, uh, that's when we'll go ahead and got it. Okay, got it. So that's your basically your time threshold for oh once yep. you hit that time to renew if you're not done. Yep. Got it. Yeah, and there's again, there's a couple of checks in here to make sure stuff doesn't go awry. Like for some reason, you know, this the clock tick was slow or something, and this is now after the TTL. You know, if for some reason you get a negative value, we won't try to renew it. There's there's just some fail safes in here to kind of try to make sure stuff doesn't because it can be weird if you're working across machines and with locking and multiple threads. You know, stuff can happen maybe that you're not expecting. It can be hard to debug. So we try to put in some some guardrails so that you don't get in this weird state where you take the lock. And then for whatever reason, you lost a lock and someone yeah. else got it. And then you clobbered them again by thinking you still had it. Uh, and so just tried to prevent those cases. That's kind of a pain in the ass. And we definitely know what that is. Uh, clock synchronization across machines is a huge pain in the ass. So sorry, yep. folks. Yep. All right. Excuse, yep. uh, excuse my language there. But uh, it yeah, is. No. <laughs> yeah, it is. I think, I think, I mean, I think all the developers. Everybody will tell you this, right? That's so, the appropriate response. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, like I said, we, we sort of jumped in here, but. The usage is pretty straightforward. You you know you try to acquire it, and then if you acquired it, you you do whatever you do. So this you can imagine is your critical section to do whatever you wanted to do. Uh, this is the the kind of just immediate try. So you either get it or you don't. Uh, the other options are to wait. Uh, so in this case, 
I'm going to wait and I didn't specify a timeout. So I just wait indefinitely. And so if someone else is holding a lock, this will just sit here and wait until the lock becomes available, uh, however long that takes. And then once I've acquired it, you know, I can do my critical section. In this case, because no timeout specified, like this really shouldn't happen. Alternatively, you can pass a timeout. So maybe you say, I want to acquire the lock, but but I only want to wait two seconds or I only want to wait some amount of time. And then if I can't get the lock, I'm going to move on and do something else. Maybe I'll come back to it or or maybe I'm going to give up. You know, this, this scenario is such that I only want to wait a little bit and then I'll move on. So this is that same thing. But you can give it a timeout and this will either acquire the lock a time span, uh, in which case you run your code or the time span will lapse. And essentially will mean you weren't able to acquire it in the time that you specified. Uh, and so just kind of show that this all works and how it works. I just got a little, this is just a little sample function app. I'll just run it real quick. And then we'll uh, run a couple of little Postman calls to show that it's working. So this is that try lock. This is the one that's going to try to acquire it immediately. And then uh, it also, just as a sample, holds the lock for 10 seconds. So that does a couple things. One, gives me some time to show that when I try to acquire it, other ones that it won't be able to, but also kind of shows that the renewal is working. So instead of it automatically expiring after one second, or five seconds or whatever you say you TTL to, it'll keep auto renewing. Uh, and so before we run those real quick, that reminded me, I was just gonna pop over here. Behind the scenes, this is what it looks like. So uh, in my Azure Cosmos DB, I've got a container, you know, it's called distributed locks. You can rename that in the config if you want. And uh, in here, there's no nothing, no locks being held. So right now there are no records in here. But one interesting thing is, you know, you mentioned the TTL, we'll come back to that. So in here, I've set it just for this demo to five seconds. So it pretty much means fail safe. After you've attained the lock, if you're not actively renewing it, your app crashed or you gave up or whatever, the, the lock will automatically release after five seconds. And you can set this down to one or you can set it to whatever is appropriate. Uh, for demo, five seconds was enough time mm -hmm. to kind of show that it was working. Uh, but this is nice because this is set on the container level. So we can just do it once and it can work everywhere. Like I said, you can set it on a record level. So we could set it on each individual item if that was the case, uh, if for some reason you needed to do that. But this is kind of nice that you can just set this once and then <laughs> no that fail safe. Yep. So uh, we'll go ahead and do this. This first one will take 10 seconds because it's holding it, but then we'll show kind of that it acquired the lock, held it for 10 seconds and then released it. And then as soon as it's done, We'll see what the output is. Nothing like a little dead air there. Uh, so you can see, uh, try lock, obtain the lock. Here's the lock ID that's uh, whatever. The e tag we expose it just for fun. And then we'll talk about that fencing token in a second. But that just shows that it obtained a lock. No, no big deal there. Some code ran, not that exciting. But what's more exciting is this, this lock was locking on a, uh, a fake value I made up. And then this other lock is essentially locking on a different value. So you can imagine these are two different usernames. And so even though they're using the same lock provider and they're locking on different granular values, and so you can still obtain this lock even while this is running. So if I run this again, this is holding that lock for 10 seconds, but I can run this one and you can immediately see that it was still able to obtain the lock because it was not trying to lock on the conflicting value. It was trying to yeah. lock on something else. There was no contention. And so it didn't have to wait. We didn't have to wait for that 10 seconds every single time we want to run an operation because there was no contention there. So that's pretty great. Um, then this one eventually finishes, fine. So we'll run this one one more time, uh, and then we'll run this timeout one, which this one will only wait two seconds. So because that one's holding it for 10, uh, you can see here this will wait. It's waiting two seconds, and then it said, I couldn't get it within two seconds, so I gave up. Uh, whereas once this is done over here, this one is done. If I run it now, it was able to get the lock right away. And so it doesn't, doesn't take two seconds to get it. It just says, I will wait only up to two seconds, uh, and then I'll just return back that I couldn't get the lock. What are you doing in that? the wait is that just are you just putting the thread asleep for whatever yeah, period of time okay. yeah. and that, yeah. that was i tried to think about a better way to do that but because like i said it's the by benefit this this is running you know over in the cosmos db your code is not there wasn't a great way i tried to think of you know how cosmos db does it with kind of you know if you're getting a request request rate too large you know and getting back a response it'll tell you like hey you know wait about this long and then try again but coordinating that across different machines and stuff wasn't super easy yeah. and so for now, it just, uh, yeah, it has a small delay in there, and then it just tries again. I, you know, and uh, you could kind of go down a rabbit hole trying to make that little piece of it bulletproof right there, and I don't know if it's really worth it. Like, if you don't acquire a lock or something, whatever, some GC happens or something, how, what, somebody kicks the plug, whatever. 
uh, process comes back, just retry. So yeah, for sure. And Cosmos DB, I mean, like you said, one of our requirements was it's fast. I mean, it's super fast. I mean, we're talking like you know single digit milliseconds. And so try to acquire the lock. If you can't do it, you know, we'll try again shortly thereafter. And it's it's really quite a small overhead. And like you said, I, I had a branch where I went down that rabbit hole and really tried to make it, you know, try to get too clever, frankly, and uh, realize at the end, I should just try again in a few seconds. That's much, much more straightforward. Way, and really, really more bulletproof in the end. Yeah. Just there's a, uh, there's that whatever maximum around simplicity, I guess that yeah, uh, yeah. just uh, don't overthink it. Yeah. <clears throat> So the last one I'll just show here real quick is this is the this is the wait that will just wait forever. So in this case, I'll I'll kick off this. It's gonna try to acquire it. I'll kick off this one, and you can see that this one will just sit here and wait as long as it takes. And you know, it's waited more than two seconds. It's waiting as long as the other one takes, and eventually the first one will finish, and then this one was able to obtain it. So, so you're just letting the requesting thread set its own wait period. There's no global. Uh, period for that at least that's not your implementation or is there a value for that uh, or so, is it just... uh i'll make i'm see if i'm answering the right question so in this specific case uh my first call there was you know try lock and then just for fun it was holding it for 10 seconds kind of its demo and so in this other case uh when i try to acquire the lock because i didn't pass a timeout the second parameter you can pass is a timeout like this one mm -hmm. Uh, it will just keep waiting. And so oh, what that wait looks like is that's where it goes to that kind of just retry, you know, try to get the lock. You couldn't, you know, sleep for a tiny amount of time. Try to get it again. Nope. Try again. Nope. Try again. Okay. I got it. Got it. Okay. Um, and that is it. There's a value you can configure. Uh, like I said, there's a couple other helper classes in there where you can configure some of the, the details. So if you know, yeah. like, Hey, I, my, my code takes kind of a long time. Like maybe my critical section takes a long time. And so if you can't get the lock, there's no point in trying again one millisecond later. Maybe you should wait, whatever. Some I, I, so that was that. you did answer my question. I was wondering, like, did you implement some sort of uh, service level retry oh. value? But it sounds like no. It's just basically whoever's requesting the lock can wait around forever, whatever they want, and then if they do, it's yeah. fine. If they don't, whatever. Yep. So, got it. Yep. And so the last thing I'll show real quick is kind of some of the inner working. So while this is running. Uh, I'll go ahead and run it. And then if we switch over to uh, here, you can see now there's a record in here. This is essentially means the lock is being held. There's that ID when it was renewed. And I probably didn't do it fast enough. But so it's you know, when it's gone, it released it. But if I did it fast enough, I would hit refresh and you would see this uh, lock last renewed that would go up. This timestamp value would increase. So while it's running, it's auto renewing itself. It's constantly updating this timestamp so that the TTL is kind of getting kicked out, getting kicked out, getting kicked out. And then once uh, the lock is, you know, abandoned, it would then, the TTL would kick in and delete this. But in this case, the code successfully finished. It didn't crash. So we released it, you know, automatically. We didn't have to wait for the fail safe, uh, which is another thing I didn't demo in here, but let's say you, you know, had a bug in your code and you didn't wrap your code into using, you know, so even though this is an eye disposable, you forgot to use the using, you acquired the lock, uh, you, you did your stuff, you you know the method exited but the the using didn't automatically release the lock because you forgot to wrap it in using so now you're holding the lock uh, what will happen is the lock will go out of scope and then eventually uh, when the gc kicks in and does a collect because the lock isn't there anymore uh it'll get cleaned up and then that ttl will kick in and it'll still clean it up so again it's kind of another fail safe where that's not the optimal use obviously you don't want to you know forget to dispose stuff but if you did uh, as soon as the GC collected your object, the TTL would kick in and you would still avoid that case where you've permanently locked everybody else out because you, you know, kind of took the lock and then abandoned it while you were holding it. So I got some more questions. Uh, yeah. uh actually, and then I see some comments from users. They want to see the code for this thing. I'm going to make you wait, uh, <laughs> till the end. So, uh, but I will share this with you. Um, you're, uh, so you're using this in a container or should be an account using strong consistency uh, that's correct right yeah and you can't i mean here's one thing i i haven't gotten super far into this but if you look at the code it's essentially a, a write only database right like we never this is one of the, the decisions we made so i've seen a couple other blocks where they will say when you try to acquire it they'll say you know read the record and see if it's you know try to read first this one is sort of optimistic saying i'm going to try to take the lock first mm. uh, and for most of the use cases that we saw that was a good way to go because at least in 
not super high contention scenarios, most of the time you can get the lock. I mean, very seldom did we run into cases where it was more often that you wouldn't be able to get the lock. And you could imagine a scenario where that would be the case and maybe that this wouldn't be the right approach. But for most of the cases we saw, it was more likely that you would be able to acquire a lock. So we just go ahead and assume you're going to be able to acquire. We say, let's take the lock. And if we can't, that's the kind of else case. But we assume we can. So this is essentially a, a right. And yeah, absurd is a right. And the delete <clears throat> is essentially right. You see in here, there's never a read in here actually at all. We do read. There is a read internally, you know, in Cosmos DB's implementation, but we never actually read. And so we're less concerned about, uh, you know, even the strong consistency. You know, you can think about, does it, you know, what if I'm going to replicate? This does sort of require a single write region. And if you do have multiple write regions, then you would need, uh, you know, strong consistency to make sure that your write was being propagated out. But otherwise, you know, like you mentioned earlier, in, internally, you know, Cosmos is going to write it to its quorum of databases. And that's going to work then because we only essentially ever write. We don't ever read. Makes sense. I mean, there is a read in the absurd, but it's yeah. it's atomic, exactly. so that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's sort of the Im okay, implementation so detail of Cosmos. Yeah. So again, like it's sort of there is a complexity there, but but it's sort of like not on us anymore. Yeah, like, it's us, right? Yeah, Cosmos service. Anymore. Yeah, service take care of that for you. So yeah, oh, this is interesting. Okay, so you're you're because just to tell you folks. So I I implemented one of these as well, or me and another guy did, and uh, um, we took a different approach. We we went uh, pessimistic on this because the scenario was around a heavily shared uh, yeah. resource there, and so yeah. we went with a read first, and then a write if the read if the if the lock was available. And that yeah. for us forces you to use strong consistency because yeah. you cannot ever have a dirty read yep. in there, right? So and just to remind folks, I'm sure most everybody knows when you write to Cosmos, it writes to three or four replicas, so it's a local majority of your replicas there. And then a read using session or weaker is only going to be single replicas. So it's possible to write the three and then read from the one that has not gotten hydrated or, or, or committed to and get a dirty read. But if you use bounded staleness or stronger, it's a two replica read. So you will always read, uh, you will always, you will never get a dirty read in there. Of course, the downside is that your reads are now twice as much as uh, yeah. they were before because you have to read from two replicas, but it guarantees that consistency. The other thing, is, uh, and I guess this wouldn't matter. Like you could run this in multiple regions, but you're write heavy, so who cares? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess. Well, and like you said, I guess so you wouldn't need to run multiple regions uh, because you're not doing reads, so that's not a big problem. Um, of course, you've got availability if a region goes down, but then that's yeah. you're going to have that. I mean, I guess you could go multi-region if you really, really needed it. Uh, but yeah, that's you're saying different. there, you're running single region, single region, and with single region, right? Um, I think you're, I think you're okay. Yeah, and so like you said, if you wanted to, you know, have super high availability and you wanted multiple regions, you could do that. Uh, you know, and then your rights would, you'd want that strong consistency to make sure your rights were, you know, getting propagated out in real yep. time. But uh, like I said, and you gave a good example there where. For a different use case, if you're very heavy on, you know, where the contention is high and, yeah. and trying to get the lock is not likely, and more often than not, you're going to not get it, then you would want to flip that around, like you said, and straight, first say, you know, can I read the lock? And if not, you know, whatever. But in this case, for all, most of the scenarios we were encountering, they were things that were, we wanted to definitely lock on and synchronize, but they weren't super contentious and they weren't super lock heavy. And so we, like I said, kind of flipped it around and said, let's just assume we can acquire the lock. And assume that's the kind of happy path. And only if you can acquire it, then kind of that's the else. else and case. the scenario specifically that I was building for was the uh, the monotonically increasing number, where I have a shared single shared resource, which is that digit, that integer, uh, and I need to make I need to ensure monotonically increasing uh, value for that thing. So everybody's going after the same thing which is why we took the approach we did is that was the that was the use case that we were building for essentially yeah and so actually i i know you mentioned to me that you built this so i i kind of put you on the spot here and we'll do a you know real-time code review so this i mentioned earlier that i did have a fencing <laughs> token in here as well uh and so that's that monotonically increasing value and so uh probably most people know but if you don't know uh this is a way to kind of have your the resource you're protecting uh make sure that it is getting, it's kind of like the e-take, it's getting a, you know, up-to-date right. So you can imagine the kind of canonical scenario is your code acquires the lock and then there's something 
that prevents it from proceeding. So there's a, a super long garbage collection routine or something else that causes it to, you know, essentially go not offline, but kind of go to sleep for a long time. Yep. And in the meantime, the, you know, you stop renewing because you're sort of asleep. The lock expires, the TTL expires. Somebody else grabs a lock and they go about their business. Then they're updating, let's say, you know, a file or something. They then now have written to it and there's a newer version over there. And then your code, you know, the GC collect finishes. Your code's like, hey, I'm awake again. I saw this lock from before. I think it's still good. Uh, and then it goes ahead and tries to write maybe to that same file. What, what you can do, I mean, if you just did nothing, you would have essentially an out of order write. And now your old, you know, prior write would overwrite your newer write. And so you can have this fencing token, this, you know, it's monotonically increasing, this big fancy way of saying, you know, always goes up uh, value. And you can have your service downstream that knows about that and say, hey, you know, you, you wrote, you know, with 3191. That was the most recent write. So if somebody comes later and they've got 3190 or 3189 or 3187 or something from before, they're going to say, hey, even though you think you have the lock, you've got an old one and you're, you're not the most up to date uh, thing anymore. And so you can use this value, assuming your downstream resources know how to, you know, to use it to kind of add another layer. Of, so it's not just, hey, I acquired the lock and I prevented someone else from doing it. It's when I actually tried to use the lock on some resource, it also knew uh, about this thing and was able to kind of prevent errant lock holders who thought they were the most recent one from mm -hmm. coming in after the fact and kind of plowing over them. I put, uh, I put a link in the, in the, um, on the screen there for folks. So if you're not familiar with this token, there's this concept called a uh, fencing token. Uh, there's a guy named Martin Kleppman who's written kind of the, I don't know, I would say the definitive book on building applications for data intensive applications here. I don't know if you can see this, this is kind of like our Bible, at least in our team, uh, this book here. Uh, most of the PMs have a copy of this thing. But he wrote an article back, oh, geez, 20, it was a while ago, uh, about this concept of a fencing token. And he actually used Redlock as an example of kind of how this would, using Redlock would cause issues if you get into this scenario like you just described. And then he introduced this concept of fencing token. And that's what exactly what we implemented for ours was this concept of fencing token. And what was nice about it is that uh, the token itself actually can be used as your auto increment uh, value in there because it's a monotonically increasing value. So it actually made it pretty simple uh, to build something like that. You just implement the fencing token in your lock and voila, you're basically done uh, with it there. So anyway, I wanted to share that link if folks are curious about um, th this concept and where, at least where I found or came across it first, it was this article by Martin Kleppman. Uh, about yeah, that the same article, I read it, and you, like you said, it, uh, it was originally kind of showing kind of some issues with Redlock, frankly. And so it was interesting to see, though, how something that looked pretty good on the surface, like, oh, this all makes a lot of sense. I read, you know, how the Redlock implementation worked, and it all sounds really good. But then when you get into the nitty gritty details, you know, it's these cases that you might think, oh, that's pretty unlikely. But, you know, it kind of shows in there, like, it's not that unlikely. And, you know, these are real things you have to worry about when you're talking about cloud distributed stuff and, and how these, you know, things that you likely would gloss over if this wasn't your you know your full-time job that could be super important you know it's the first time you you know overwrite some data with old stale data and you've lost something that's pretty bad so yeah really interesting and he had a, an interesting comment in there as well in that article uh, i'm trying to remember exactly but it, it was something along the lines of like if, if consistency is the is the high order bit here then this is the way you go it, but if it doesn't matter <laughs> then, yeah and you could go with with something that doesn't care that much. And I, I'm trying to remember what was the flip side of that coin, but it was uh, at, at one point kind of a, a serious consideration, but also kind of a meh. If you don't if you don't care about what you're doing, yeah. then sure, don't bother. Yeah, I think he gets into you know cap theorem and stuff. And like you said, you know, it's that classic. You know, you can have two, but not three. And so anyway, yeah, it's I think that you know the takeaway was just that is there are a lot of cases where this might be perfectly acceptable. There might be some where it's completely unacceptable, and you just have to make that determination. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to put up uh, your GitHub repo here so that people can see. I'll leave that up for a few minutes there. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. And while we do that, I'm going to switch back real quick. So we, we saw the code. We saw how it worked. Uh, just kind of recap. So this was kind of our new improvement. So we saw our first version, you know, it was very specific for our use case. It was really just about kind of protecting duplicate usernames. And that's all it did. But with this new uh, library, uh, you can try to acquire the lock immediately like we originally had, but you can also wait a set amount of time or wait indefinitely. So if you want to coordinate work that has nothing to do with, you know, getting the lock immediately, but you want to say, hey, I just want to wait and process my code when I when I can get the lock, you can do that now. 
Uh, like you said, using the iDisposable lets you use features like the using, which was super nice. Like that lets you release your lock as soon as you're done with code. So much faster, you can get a lot higher throughput. Uh, having that auto renewal of the lock means that you're not tied to the TTL. The TTL is now just a fail safe to make sure you never hold it indefinitely, but you it won't get released out from under you essentially. The lock is self-renewing. And because of all those things, it was kind of generalized for any case. So you can imagine, I mean, lots of cases, but you know, ones that come to mind, I think I'd put in the documentation, you know, things like, you know, maybe you've got a order system and you want to update inventory, you know, and multiple people are buying the items and you're trying to track inventory and, you know, you don't want to get down to, you know, negative one things remaining or whatever. Uh, you can use this for that same username. case. You can use it for anywhere where you want to coordinate work across you know, multiple things. And one thing I didn't put on this slide, but was sort of uh, interesting is because the database is the thing that's ultimately holding it, it's sort of, it's code and even service agnostic. So you can imagine a scenario where maybe you've got a website and it's you know written in C sharp or something. It's a web app uh, and it's a or like an e-commerce site and people are making orders to your website and buying stuff. But you've also got a backend process. Maybe it's written in Node or something else that's you know doing order inventory as you receive shipments or something. Those two services don't have to be the same. They don't have to be in the same language. All they have to do is use the same lock container name and then you can synchronize work across completely disparate uh, services. So that's a pretty cool use case too. I got a uh, funny you bring up product catalog. So I built a separate example for doing high contention product catalog. So this is like, let's just say you're some, you know, e-commerce retailer that's named mm -hmm. after a jungle. Sure. And you have a uh, like a 60 inch OLED TV for a hundred bucks and it's Black Friday or, or whatever, mm -hmm. Cyber Monday. Uh, you're going to have a huge amount of contention for that thing. But what's, the trick is you need to maintain an inventory count that's going to be accurate and then also does not allow you to get oversold. Uh, mm -hmm. So we came up with a, uh, a concept and an implementation that uses what we are calling a distributed counter. And it's basically kind of like a sharded counter that uses individual documents that themselves maintain some segment of inventory, but collectively uh, have the total uh, in there. And we've actually got a proof of concept on this thing working. We're, we just got like two seconds where we're not trying to deliver something else. We're going to yeah. get this thing published. You mean you're busy? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a little busy. Like this bill that's coming up, this will date the show, but build 23, 2023 is coming up next week and I'm going kind of crazy anyway. Uh, but so we have a implementation for this distributed counter. That's uh, another approach you could take versus a distributed lock. Uh, and the reason it works is in each of the individual counters is itself a document. Uh, and the way you distribute um, reads or writes to this thing is basically just through kind of a random number generator over the number of documents. Uh, and then you basically lock that document for that update, and then you release it quickly again. And the more documents you've got, the more scalable the counter is in there. Um, so anyway, I'll uh, I'll share it with you uh, at some point. Yeah. You can you can take that and make it better than what yeah. I showed you. So because yeah, I think I. Did I was I the one to introduce you to the fencing token uh, concept? Yeah, I, we had a previous conversation, and you kind of offhand mentioned it. And I had read that article before, but never really put two and two together that hey, this is the exact use case that this is for. And so, yeah, totally, totally motivated. Well, that's cool. Uh, that's living the Microsoft values there, uh, yeah. right there, Brian. So I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it in my connect. <laughs> that's it. I well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm gonna go and fold back your auto renew. And your eye disposable uh, implementation there, there because go. that actually fixes two things that I did not like about our implementation, which was you had to explicitly release the thing, yeah, uh, if you wanted to get better performance. Because, like you said, the the, the minimum grain for a TTL is a second, and that's way too long, uh, yeah. frankly, for especially for a system where like what we built ours for, which was for, for very high contention on yeah. a resource. So allowing it to uh, basically go out of scope once you, once you exit the critical section and just do so automatically is, yeah. uh, is lovely. Uh, that's brilliant for us. Um, yeah. When, you know, when Cosmos is operating in, you know, single digit milliseconds, one second is a, is a long That's time. too long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's just, <laughs> we're blowing, we're blowing away SLAs at that point. Yeah. Uh, cause it's like, well, 10X. Even, like that counter that you were talking about again, like it just shows like there's, there's lots of ways to solve a problem and you could yeah. probably solve it with a lock, but maybe the counter is better in that scenario, or maybe, you know, in a different scenario, there's a different solution. Yep. Or maybe one where you assume there's contention. So yeah, it's just, it's, there's always a, a different solution for something. So that's why well, it's fun. To I mean, you just proved here, right? Like there's, uh, uh, 
Like we both built distributed locks and your approach is separate than ours because of the, the scenario it's designed for, yeah. which was yeah. uh, that you don't have a small number of high contention resources. You've got well, potentially a large number. It could be as large as whatever, uh, but it serves the purpose uh, in the approach, yeah. whether it's a read first or write first uh, approach. Yeah, in there. that's uh, a great way to put it. We have a large set, but a very low contention for it versus, you know, and so yeah. But the consistency matters, right? So that's the, obviously the higher order bit you cannot have conflicts naming conflicts uh within there so yep. um and, which is why i mean that's one of the reasons why you would use a distributed lock in the first place right is yep. uh, you need to guarantee uniqueness across the system so yep. very cool i hope people got that github repo because i left it up for a long time i had your uh your twitter handle uh in your name there but if people didn't catch it uh i'll put it up there so if you want to just give brian a shout out uh feel free to yep. reach out to him on twitter right there uh, yeah, and then here, questions about it, comments, feedback, whatever. Well, I'll put the feedback on your issues list, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. File issue. File an issue, right? Come on. It's, the, it's 2023 right now. Don't uh, don't put it on Twitter. Uh, all right. Uh, this is great, Brian. I've been wanting to have you on the show. I think you were in Cosmos yeah. Conf, which is when I first yeah. uh, ran through or saw your session in there. And I'm like, I got to get him on the show because this is 10 minutes at Cosmos Conf is not nearly enough time to talk about uh, what we talked yeah. about today. And we spent nearly an hour uh, yeah. talking about it. So uh, it was super fun. It was really fun to come on and talk with you and talk about the details of this. So yeah, I had a great time. This is the, this is the, I, this is why I love working on this team, right? So it's just good distributed systems, goodness uh, here. And, and right here, this is one of the things I love talking about. So uh, yeah. right on Brian. Hey, thank you so much for coming on and thanks for sharing yeah. uh, with everyone. Uh, we had lots of people watching the show today, so there was a lot of interest in this thing. Uh, so I really appreciate you coming on and uh, and sharing with what you built. Yeah, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everyone. Uh, next week, what do we got here? I don't know what we're doing, but, well, I do know what we're doing. We're going to build next week. Uh, yeah. So we're not going to have a show. Uh, this is episode 81, by the way. I can't believe I've done over 80 of these episodes. Uh, so that means we've got 80 other episodes. Uh, that you can go and spend a weekend or a week probably now binge watching uh, all the other great episodes and content we've gotten there. Uh, feel free to check us out at our user group on Meetup, uh, aka MS slash Cosmos DB user group. Uh, that's it for us this week, folks. Uh, hope to see you at Build next week. Uh, I'll be there in person uh, or otherwise check us out. Uh, it's going to be a hybrid this year where you've got in person and then all digital uh, as well. So. That's it, folks. Good to see you. Brian, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks, folks. Bye-bye.